Right now, 50 wheel tackle tough times in California. The economic troubles facing San Diego will be the focus of Mayor Jerry Sanders' annual State of the City. The reports a 60% hike in rapes where either one or both people... ...there was track the progress of 50 sarcoma patients using... From the KPBS studios, this is San Diego Week. Good evening. I'm Amitha Sharma. Thanks for joining us. Cal State trustees make the new president of San Diego State University the highest paid in the system and in almost the same breath raise student fees yet again. Veterans who live on the street are about to get some much needed help. Plus, there's an obesity epidemic in a San Diego County town that surpasses the nation's. And we'll preview what Comic Con International will showcase next week. That's coming up next on San Diego Week. But first, the headlines. Students attending California's public universities will be paying more this year. Katie Orrit joins me from the KPBS News Center. Katie, how much will tuition increase? It's a significant increase, Amitha. The trustees for both the California State University System and the University of California have voted to increase tuition for the second time this year. Tuition for the UC schools was increased nearly 10 percent. CSU students will see their tuition rise 12 percent. Both systems are dealing with a $650 million cut in state funding. The operation of San Diego's Miramar landfill could be put out to bid. A city council committee has voted to move the issue to the full council for consideration. If ultimately approved, San Diego will begin soliciting bids to run the landfill this fall. Private companies could compete with city employees to create the most efficient management plan. A winner would likely not be selected until next spring. And San Diego voters may get to decide whether recently passed regulations on medical marijuana dispensaries in the city are too harsh. Critics of the regulations have collected enough signatures to put the issue on the June ballot. The city council must now decide whether to overturn the rules or let the issue go to voters. The council will take it up before the end of the month. And San Diego will be home to the nation's first all-electric car sharing service this fall. Daimler-owned Car2Go picked San Diego because the city will have more than 1,000 public charging stations by the end of the year. The service will allow drivers to use a smartphone app or the web to find a car, drive it, and then leave it. Car2Go officials said the system works great for short, spontaneous one-way trips. At a time when San Diego State University has seen its funding slashed and students have been forced to pay ever higher tuition, Cal State trustees this week approved a $400,000 pay package for the college's new president, Elliot Hirschman. It's a move that did not sit well with Governor Jerry Brown and many in the public. Earlier today, I sat down with President Hirschman to discuss his compensation and his plans for the future of San Diego State. In the interest of full disclosure, San Diego State University holds KPBS's broadcast license. Dr. Hirschman, welcome. More than $650 million was cut from the Cal State system this year. Instructors have been laid off, classes have been canceled, and just this week, Cal State trustees voted to increase fees by 12%. Against this backdrop, why do you think you should be paid $400,000 a year? Sure. Um, I want to, want to talk a little bit about the background of some of the compensation issues, and I appreciate your giving me an opportunity to go into that. Um, the way compensation is set for university presidents is that the chancellor and the board of the system, prior to the start of the search, uh, conduct a national study to try to understand uh, the nature of appropriate compensation for the presidential position they're going to recruit. And so that's the process that uh, Chancellor Reed and the board went through. Uh, and then they proceeded with that through the search. Uh, I was uh, very honored to be offered the position. And right now, my focus is on uh, doing everything possible to support the students, faculty, and staff of San Diego State University. Now, I want to elaborate on the question in a number of ways. Uh, first, I do want to commend uh, uh, Mr. Carter, the chair of the board, for his thoughts about revisiting this subject. Uh, this was a, a fairly complicated situation that the offer that was made to me 
preceded uh, the cuts as they came down and some of the effects that you're discussing. Uh, so what he's going to do is convene a committee of the board to examine the processes for presidential search and, and, and compensation. And I think that's a sober and appropriate thing to do, and I'm very supportive of that approach. A point that I think is relevant to the issues you raise about resources concerns my focus on bringing resources into the university. And that's something that I will be spending a, a very large portion of my time so we can be sure to be able to support our faculty, to ensure access for students to continue our programs uh, in the community moving forward. As you know, Governor Brown wrote a letter to Cal State trustees this week in which he expressed concern. He said, quote, he worries that they're setting a pattern for public service that we cannot afford. What do you think of his comments? So uh, I appreciate what the governor is saying. I understand the motivation. And I think that uh, Chair Carter, in moving towards this committee, is attempting to begin to address that process. Uh, I also want to emphasize that uh, the governor, through uh, colleagues and representatives, has conveyed to me that, of course, this is nothing personal. It was an issue of timing. This is also nothing about San Diego State, but rather his perspective on this issue. And I respect that. The uh, point that I conveyed back to the governor is both that I respect his position in moving this forward, as well as many others. Uh, and what I'm eager to do is work with him uh, in supporting our students, in supporting our faculty, moving forward community engagement. And I believe there's a strong uh, reciprocal goal there. Getting back to student fees, tuition has gone up almost 92% in the last four years, making college very difficult to attain in California, um, which is a part of the dream here. Um, how worried are you that, that college will will increasingly, that money will increasingly become a barrier to higher public education? It's an excellent question. One of the defining characteristics of San Diego State and the broader California State University system is a focus on access and excellence. And so as we have gone through this period, and of, I would agree wholeheartedly that there are the tuition raise is regrettable though necessary. Uh, we have made it a priority to focus on access. So one of our steps and our uh, sister institutions in the CSU share this step is we will be reserving approximately eight million dollars in the tuition revenue to support financial aid. This will be for students whose families are below seventy thousand dollars in income and we are going to assure that for those families they do not pay a single penny more associated with this tuition increase. And we really want to get that word out. We don't want students to become discouraged. We don't want them to think, oh, I can't be part of this dream that, as you uh, cite, is so important. We're also doing financial aid counseling. So there are students whose families' income is between 70 and 180,000. Uh, those students are, uh, do have a federal tax credit available that will give a dollar for dollar offset. And so we want people to be aware of that. Uh, we're also targeting our fundraising efforts on student scholarships. In this past year, we raised $31 million to support student scholarships, and that's going to be a continued focus in this coming year. And I've already uh, had very extensive discussions with donors and friends of the university about this issue, and I know people are very, very supportive. Uh, people want to keep that access open. It's a priority. Very quickly now, uh, graduation rates at the university in 2010, we're at 66 percent. That's a huge increase from 38 percent back in 2002. What do you plan to do to boost them even further? All right. Uh, so first, I want to acknowledge President Weber and his team and their focus and what they've done. Uh, they have focused on that combination of access and excellence so that an open door doesn't become a revolving door. And the progress has been extraordinary. Uh, progress across all groups and I think there's a lot that the university has to be proud of. Uh, in this area there are many people at the university who are working on it. What they're doing is really breaking the process down. So they are looking at each aspect of admissions, financial aid, uh, students matriculation, academic performance and being sure that we're working on each of those areas so that the graduation rates uh, can increase even further. 
No doubt you've seen them on the street. They have mental illnesses. They're grappling with addictions. They haven't been able to get back on their feet. They are homeless veterans. And today marked the start of an annual program called Stand Down that helps the veterans restart their lives. Joining me to talk about Stand Down is KPBS's Home Post military blogger Beth Ford Roth. Beth, what is Stand Down and, and how did it get started? It started back in 1988 by uh, Veterans Village of San Diego. And it's basically an opportunity for homeless veterans to take advantage of services that we, you know, take advantage of every day, basically, in our homes. Um, a hot shower, a haircut, clean clothes, um, perhaps an opportunity to vin visit a dentist. They probably haven't seen a dentist in a long time. Go to the doctor, um, get legal services. It just runs the gamut of, of um, basically different services that someone who lives on the street just wouldn't be able to have access to. How many homeless veterans are here in San Diego? Well, we think there's between 3,000 and 4,000 homeless veterans in San Diego right now. And what kind of crowd, crowds do you expect this weekend? Well, they're expecting upwards of about 1,000. Um, it seems to increase every year that they've done this. And considering the economy this year, there are more, more folks actually out on the street. So they anticipate probably about 1,000 homeless veterans. How successful has this program been in helping these veterans restart their lives? Well, what's interesting is we actually sent a reporter out to um, the stand down today, which it began today, and she was able to speak with a few of those uh, homeless veterans, and, and they can tell you themselves. I've been coming here since 1988, and um, actually to get some... Uh, some glasses. Well, I'm here at the stand down because it's to help me out with some of my court cases for uh, tickets and stuff past history, uh, some clothing. I need help with my clothing and housing issues. I've, through medical reasons, lost my um, left leg, and my husband, through other reasons, lost his left leg and has got a lot of medical problems. Basically, we're both, like I said, homeless and. Um, Hopefully, now that I'm out of the hospital and pretty much healed, I'm hoping to find us a place to live so that um, we can both be together. And this is really an opportunity for people who are, are looking for help. They say it's a, a hand up, not a handout. And, you know, folks who haven't had a home like the woman we saw there, um, you know, she may be able to, with assistance of, of uh, housing authorities and legal authorities, um, Social Security um, assistance, can maybe make that dream come true. So it's, um, it's a really important event. And San Diego was the first place that it started, and it has spread through uh, a variety of communities throughout the United States. Beth, switching gears slightly, for the first time ever, active duty troops are going to be marching in San Diego's Gay Pride Parade Saturday. How did this come about? What can you tell me about it? Well, it's a really big deal because of what's going on sort of um, legally with gays in the military. Um, don't Ask, Don't Tell has been repealed. Uh, President Obama signed that law, and the military has been slowly working towards that, training the troops um, to prepare them for when the law is fully enacted or the repeal is fully enacted. Recently, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, had a ruling saying it, the ban needs to start now, and so there's sort of legal wrangling going on. So this is sort of an opportunity while this is happening for um, folks who have been hiding for years, hiding their identities, um, to come out and um, to join together. There's about 350 active troops, um, both gay and straight, and they're not allowed to wear their uniforms, but they'll be wearing, you know, Army T-shirts, Navy T-shirts, and marching together and um, basically for the first time being able to, to show who they are. Um, and um, they're pretty excited about it. Very quickly, how significant is this step? It's a significant step because it's showing sort of where we're turning that you can s say who you are um, without worrying about getting kicked out of the military, about you know losing your benefits and all of that kind of thing. So it's a big step in that it's sort of, um, um, I think a bellwether of what we're going to see in the future of maybe people that we didn't know were gay and in the military being able to finally come out and say, yes, this is who I am and I don't have to be afraid of, of losing my position in the military anymore. Beth Ford Roth, thank you for speaking to us. You're welcome.
When a Chula Vista teacher proposed weighing the kids in her school district, she didn't expect to find an obesity epidemic that outpaced the nation's. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert tells us about the study and what the city's elementary schools are doing to fight the trend. Ready, set, go. The kids at Chula Vista's Kellogg Elementary School are just getting warmed up for all the activities at their year-end fitness fair. If you look on your event pass, there are wonderful activities that you will participate in, like the basketball shoot, the football throw, the hurdles, hula hoops, the jump rope. Students and parents agree that there is a fun alternative to watching movies in class as the school year winds to a close. It's really good that we get to like get out and exercise because instead of being cooped up in the classroom. They have all these games and they're so absorbed on TV. Now they're actually playing outside, so that's awesome. This is a great uh, opportunity for them, you know, to be enjoying, enjoying the uh, we beautiful weather we have in San Diego. Having fun is one goal of the afternoon, but the fair is part of a year-long effort to make students healthier. Bend down and touch your toes. Chula Vista Elementary School District did a district-wide height and weight surveillance uh, in the fall. And what we saw, that there was a need to improve the physical fitness of our students. And that that is tied to uh, greater achievement and learning and feeling good about being at school. So, you know, this is important to us. Nationally, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate about 17% of kids between the ages of 2 and 19 are obese. But Chula Vista's height and weight survey found the numbers are even worse in their schools. Nearly half of first grade girls and more than a third of first grade boys were overweight. By the sixth grade, more than half of all students were overweight and a quarter were considered obese. Across California, students' weight and height are only recorded in the fifth grade. After its survey, Chula Vista is now the only district in the state to have this detailed a picture of nearly all students from preschool to sixth grade. The survey was Sharon Hillage's idea. Uh, we've been operating with assumptions and very limited information. Uh, so having this wealth of, of data really allows us to, to do a better job of, of knowing what we need to do. The schools with the highest rates of obesity are located in what have come to be known as food deserts. There are fast food restaurants nearby, but few grocery stores. There are fewer parks, and the neighborhoods tend to have more violent crime. All of these factors stand in the way of making healthy lifestyle choices. That's why the district superintendent is intent on working with students' families. We need to be very focused in our approach to ensure that um, we're, we're actually changing lifestyles and, and, and the focus has to be in those specific critical areas where we have higher incidence of obesity. The district is already making plans. They'll overhaul food programs, bring in more local produce, and give students healthier options. They're looking to hire physical education teachers for some schools, and they want to start after school farmers markets. Escobedo says these efforts are critical. So it's going to be very interesting because typically when you have systemic change, it takes five to ten years. And we're trying to accelerate that change because we're talking about the lives of kids. We're talking about kids who, when they're 30, they're, they'll have some, um, you know, either diabetes or heart attacks. We, we cannot wait. We, we, we have to do something now. If Chula Vista can accelerate these changes, they hope their efforts, like Kellogg Elementary's Fitness Fair, can serve as a model for school districts across California and the country. Hillage's campaign to tell parents, teachers, and other staff about her findings has already started to trickle down to the students at Kellogg. They know the Fitness Fair is equal parts fun and serious. I know this for a fact. Most kids is like obese and like they don't like go out and be active. So this is really a good chance for all of us to be active and play. Chula Vista will be tracking students' progress when they do the height and weight survey again in the fall of 2012. Kyla Calvert will be following their efforts over the coming year. 
Next week, downtown San Diego will be ground zero for pop culture fans. Movies, television, and comic books will all be celebrated at Comic Con International. It's the world's largest pop culture convention, and it's held every year here. Joining me to talk about Comic Con are two people who've gone there for years. Beth Accomando is the KPBS film critic. Anders Wright is the film critic for San Diego City Beat. Beth, let's start with you. Comic Con International is known for drawing huge crowds. Will this year be any different? Yeah, it's going to be huge. The one thing is, is that the con has put a cap on the number of people who can come because there's no more room to expand at this point. So it's been roughly about 125,000 uh, the past few years, and that looks to be about what it's going to be this year, and it will be crowded. Anders, Hollywood movies have always been a big part of this event. We're now hearing reports that may not be the case. Is that true? If so, why? I don't really think that that's the case. What happens every year is that two or three studios don't bring forth a couple of the big movies that people want to see and hear about. Uh, in this case, this year's Disney isn't going to bring the Avengers, and there's going to be no presence of the new Batman movie, at least officially. But there are a lot of other big, high-profile films that are showing up, and uh, including Fox, which last year... Uh, didn't bring anything. I just bring two big movies. So that's uh, the Planet of the Apes movie and Prometheus, the new Ridley Scott movie. So I think there will be plenty of film options there for people who are interested in that. Beth, are there going to be any huge celebrities that make an appearance this year? Well, celebrities for me might be a little different than for other people, <laughs> but for me, the, the big celebrities are the directors. So Francis Ford Coppola is coming mm -hmm. back. He had been here when he had done Dracula back in the late 80s, early 90s. And one of the big pieces of news now is that it looks like Steven Spielberg is going to be making his first appearance for the film Tintin. So that's, that's going to be his first time out here. Uh, you know, last year they had Harrison Ford come out for the first time in handcuffs for Cowboys and Aliens, but um, he's doing Tintin, which is an adaptation of a French comic book, hugely popular comic book in Europe. I don't know if it's going to have the same appeal over here in the United States, but it's also got Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg, the two people who are involved in Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, which are very, very popular at Comic-Con, those two guys. So well, it'll be an interesting panel, I think. Is it easy for a conference or a Comic-Con attendees to interact with celebrities, and how does that work? Usually you're not going to be interacting with the people that are on the panels, but a lot of people will be uh, doing autograph signing. Those kind of people you can interact with a bit. And there are people who are going to be in the booths. I mean, if you're interested in meeting some of the comic book writers at DC or at Marvel or Dark Horse or things like that, those kind of people you probably will have a chance to interact with. But the big Hollywood celebrities are probably whisked in just for the panel and whisked right back, back out. So television shows are the subject of panels, um, are, such as Lost in the Past. Sure. Are there going to be, is television going to pay, play a big presence on these a panels Actually, this year? television has really almost eclipsed uh, how big the movies are in recent years, and uh, this year will be no different. Almost every network is bringing all of its big shows. Uh, HBO has Game of Thrones and True Blood, which will be really big hits as always. Uh, Dexter will be there. and. Uh, Wilfred, Elijah Wood, who's usually a film actor, is bringing his TV show. Uh, there's almost no TV show that's fairly mainstream that is not represented with the celebrity guests as well. So what advice do you have for people who got tickets this year in terms of where to park and where to eat? <laughs> <laughs> well, where to park, if you don't already have your parking permits and stuff, don't even bother coming down. Try to take the trolley or get dropped off or walk or whatever. But um, the main thing I would say is make sure you look at the, the grid, the program grid that they have available online and in the programs, and kind of plan out your attack. Decide what you want to see, what things you really want to wait in line for that you're willing to put in the hours for. Um, pack a lot of food in, pack mm -hmm. water in, uh, you know, make sure you have all the necessities. You know, like the zombie apocalypse, be ready for anything. <laughs> you should know where you are and where you should be at every, all the yeah. time. If you're not, you're, you're sort of like a deer in the headlights, frozen. What are, you, what are you both most excited about this year? Let's start with you. Well, I, honestly, Prometheus is a big one, the, uh, the big Ridley Scott movie, which is sort of uh, attached to Alien and Aliens, those films, uh, something I'm eager to see. I'm kind of eager to see Tintin, the, uh, the, the movie that uh, Beth was talking about. It's something that I grew up reading. Um, so uh, those, are, those are two on my list right there. What about you? Well, 
I always love to see Bruce Campbell. He's going to be there for the Sam Axe movie. And um, Attack the Block is a film that Edgar Wright's producing, and it's a British comedy about teens fighting off an alien invasion. So I'm going to be there for that panel. And I think the best kept secret at Comic Con is their film festival. Every year I have seen outstanding movies there, especially their documentaries. And it's run over at the Marriott. Great films running all day, all four days, and it's really worth checking out. Andrew, is, is the San Diego Film Society going to air a film at uh, Comic-Con? Yeah, the Film Critics Society, actually. Yes, we're, we're going to screen Ghost World, which uh, is in its 10th year. It's a terrific movie. It's based on uh, Daniel Close's really wonderful comic book. And it, it's, it's a film that sort of is opposite of, of most of the comic book movies that we see today. There are no superheroes. It's just a great story. When it came out 10 years ago, the, uh, uh, the, the Film Critics Society gave it a number of awards, and it looks like we're going to get some talent to show up and actually put in an appearance as well. And that's Saturday night, 9 p.m., uh, at the Reading Gas Lamp Cinemas, Gas Lamp Cinemas, and no badge required. So, Beth, Andrews, thank you so much for speaking to us today. And now here's Katie Orr with an update on what KPBS is working on for next week. Comic-Con, it's not just for guys anymore. New stats show the number of women attending the convention nearly equals the number of men. We'll have more on that next week on Morning Edition. And on Midday Edition, tune in to hear a special series on the health of the ocean. Thanks, Katie. All of the stories you saw tonight can be viewed on our website at kpbs.org slash sdweek. And now, here's a look at your weekend weather forecast. Thanks for watching, and good night.